morning. Um, okay, I have a lot to say today. I have a lot of scriptures. Oh, okay, Bob Redding, I saw you go, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm teasing, he didn't do that. <laughs> but that's okay, because I have so much scripture today. Um, so <laughs> you're just going to have to bear with it. <laughs> um, this topic, I know that there's been lots of stepping on toes lately and um, a lot of challenging messages that we've heard, and they have been incredibly amazing. Um, today, I don't want to step on toes. Today, I want to talk to you from a real place of my heart, a real, um, like a mom or a grandma to some of you. I want you to hear the heart and passion of Jesus for you that is real and valid. We're called to be disciples. We're called to become disciples, not just followers. The followers that followed Jesus were fair, fair weather at times, weren't they? So I want us to challenge ourselves and evaluate, am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? A disciple of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one that was slain, the one that was given to us as the tool that would bring us into eternity with the Father. I want us to think about today, our, our, my message is called, Run to Jesus and Just Stand. I want us to look at what it's like for a disciple when life is hard, when things get tough, when it's difficult. I call these the suddenlies. And people go, what's a suddenly? I made up this word. It's mine because I've had suddenlies happen in my life. A suddenly is that all of a sudden something happens when you least expect it. And every single one of us on the earth go through the suddenlies. Someone hurts your feelings, questions your integrity, gossips about you. You receive a bad diagnosis from the doctor. They have no real answers of hope. Your company's downsizing and you don't make the cut and you get laid off or you get fired because maybe in number one, somebody gossiped about you and maligned your name. The one you love takes their love away. Why wasn't I enough? You loved me once. Why couldn't you just stay and try? That makes me cry. Your child says you failed them. You were a horrible parent. You were never there for me. You, you, and I want to live my life, Mommy. But leave me alone. I know my life better than you do. You were never there for me when I was young. Why would I want you there now? Sometimes words out of a rage or out of a moment of rebellion, they hurt. but we've tried so hard to love and nurture them, but they just don't see it. That's painful, isn't it? That hurts. This pandemic hits. Who do we believe? The media is telling us one thing. Somebody's telling us another. We're watching all around. What in the world is our basis of truth? How do we know what's right? Is it all a hoax? It's all bad news. What about the elections? I'm so glad you spoke on that, Jen, and prayed for the peace of heaven because there is no scrambling in heaven. The Father is on the throne. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God and his Holy Spirit is moving in our midst. There is no freaking out in heaven. Our God is God. But the media... What is our truth source? Where are we going? Who do we listen to? What camp do we listen to? I'm so afraid if 
dot, dot, dot wins. Either side. I'm so afraid. What's going to happen to me? And that's the bottom line question in all of this. What is going to happen to me? How is my life going to be changed? Will I survive whatever the results are in any of these situations? How am I going to make it? Life is happening all around us all the time, and we aren't immune to life, are we? Now, I, I'm, I'm kind of an open book, and when I get up here, I just talk from my quiet times. And it's kind of an amazing thing that God always has something to say if you just read Scripture, if you pray through Scripture, if you, if you study Scripture, if you are a disciple of what God left us as the Word of God. He always has something to say, even in Leviticus. I'm in the New Testament now. I've, um, I've been reading through the Bible for five years now. I go slow. I say this every time I get up because I'm not in a hurry. I just want to meet with Jesus. I want to meet with the Father, and I want the Holy Spirit to speak. So I'm in the New Testament, and I am going so slow through the Gospels because I want to catch every glimpse of Jesus that I didn't see before. I'm in the last chapters of John right now before he, Jesus is crucified. Chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all the last words of Jesus in the upper room. Did you know that? It's the last thing Jesus wanted to tell his disciples. It's the last message he has to share with them before he dies. And I want us to look at this and see what is it that Jesus, what would you say to your kids, the last thing you would ever have to say? This is, this is that point. This is that moment that Jesus is saying, I have some things that are really important for you to know. Sorry, I have Claritin mouth. Anybody have allergies? Okay, Claritin dries your mouth out like nobody's business. So, Jesus has some things to say to us that I want us to look at today. So we're going to just take a glimpse. Um, I, I'm just going to give you, like, just a glimpse of 13, 14, and then we're going to dive into 15 and 16. Um, the title of this message is Run to Jesus and Just Stand. Okay, so it's what does a disciple do in times and of difficulty, in seasons of hardship? I want us to look at this because I want our hearts to engage. Now, men, I want your minds to connect to your hearts. Women, I want your hearts to doubly engage. Because we, we listen from here, men, you listen from here. We need the combination to hear what Jesus is saying, to get the full glimpse of what he's trying to tell us. Now, I'm, I am all about a good movie, but I love Hallmark movies. You know why? Because I don't like drama. I don't like struggle. I don't, and they're so fluffy. It's just a little, oh, that was awful, and there we go. It's all better. I love that kind of life. My husband goes, and he'll just sit with me sometimes, and I go, you don't have to watch this. He goes, no, I'm spending time with you. And he's just like <laughs> laughing. But they're all the same. They all are the same movie. It's just, it's just fall or Christmas or Valentine's. It's all the same movie. I know that. I love it. Because <laughs> I want happy, happy, joy, joy. Yes. That's, that's what I love. I don't like drama. So... Think about Jesus, and he's got some things to say. The context, Jesus in the upper room. Okay, he washes his disciples' feet. This is John 13. Washes his disciples' feet as the evening meal is being prepared. Then he says to them, I am going to be betrayed. And he serves Judas, the bread. That gets to me. Because his love for Judas never ceased. His intentionality to bless this guy 
who he knew was going to betray him, blows me away. But it says that Jesus is troubled in his spirit, and then he tells, Jesus, or tells Judas, what you are about to do, do quickly. And Satan entered Judas's heart, and he left. Then in chapter 13, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. And Peter's going, but I love you. How I would never do that because Jesus is saying to them to love one another. The world will know me by your love. Love one another. He just gave a great example in Judas. Love one another. Peter stands up and goes, I'll never leave you. I'm going to fight for you. And Jesus goes, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Then in chapter 14, Jesus comforts his disciples, and he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. So he's setting a stage of some things he's going to tell them, things that are difficult that he wants them to be aware of. He tells them then he is the only way to the Father. No one can come to God the Father without going through Jesus Christ. And then he promises them the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father to give you an advocate. An advocate. Somebody who's going to stand beside you. Someone who's going to walk with you. And they still don't understand, well, what is a what? I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. They've had Jesus. They haven't needed the entity, the person of the Holy Spirit, yet they walked with Jesus who walked in the fullness of God. And then we go to John 15. So they're, they're a little bit confused. They go to John 15, and Jesus tells them, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. Apart from me, you will bear no fruit. But in me, we will walk together, and you will have a fullness of life bearing fruit. But remember, at times, you will be pruned, because where you bear fruit, that is the area that God will prune so that you bear more fruit. So that you bear more fruit. Sometimes it feels like a cutting off we don't understand, especially if we're not abiding tightly to Jesus. Then he says, so in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. Then he says, the world hates the disciples. The world is going to hate you because you're my disciple, because the world does not know me. The world does not have an understanding of who I am, and you have an enemy of your soul who, see, who knows who I am, so they're going to attack you because of me. You will have hard times by being a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus had hard times. We are promised the same because he's our master. He's our teacher. He's, he's the one. We will live what he lived. We will experience what he experienced. This is all in these passages of scripture. And then it, uh, he again reiterates the work of the Holy Spirit, the one that I'm sending you. He will affirm all these things. He will remind you of all these things I've shared with you. Remember the Holy Spirit. And then it says that the disciples' grief turned to joy in chapter 16. So chapters 15 and 16, they're broken into chapters, but it's, the, it's like in the same breath Jesus is saying all of this. Now, I was going to go through all of these passages, but I, I really, okay, these are all the scripture <laughs> that I was going to read. But I really want to focus on one thing. When the spirit of truth comes... Okay, the gift that we've been given is not that we have to go see Jesus anymore. We don't go to his location. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. They all have different workings, but they are one. And so Jesus says, I must go so that I can send the Holy Spirit, which is us. We are coming, and we are going to dwell within you. We're not going to be having to go find him. He will dwell within us. Does that make sense to you? So the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. 
He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. And he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So he, it's the direct connection that we're looking for. The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit is our great connection to the Father. And then in, in 15, um, 1515, it says, All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me, and he will make known to you. The connection is so great, and it's so important for us to know this. The disciples' grief turns to joy in chapter 16 of uh, John. And I, I share this because so often in the midst of, of trying to comprehend what's going on in our difficult situations, we don't really understand. We can't comprehend, we can't compute the struggle because we only know in part. And I feel like this is what was going on with the disciples. They just couldn't comprehend fully what Jesus was saying to them. But Jesus does say this. He says, it's like a woman who goes through the 24 to 36 hours of labor, excruciating pain. But the moment the baby is born, that grief turns to joy. We now have the end story of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, and our eternal destiny now. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand that Jesus said, I'm leaving and I'll go away, but I'll, I'll come get you. They couldn't comprehend in their mind's eye what that meant. What do you mean you're going away? Where are you going? What do you mean we won't see you again? These are things that he was telling them in these chapters. They couldn't comprehend. But in just that example of a, a woman having her child, it's almost like we get the benefit of hindsight is foresight. We now know the end of the story. They didn't. Can you imagine what they were going through, what they were feeling, experiencing? Now, I relate that to you and me, okay? You get a diagnosis. I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. You just have to wait it out. I keep getting that diagnosis, <laughs> and it's kind of stinky, because it's like, you know, so I just have to wait? There's nothing I can do? There's no help, no hope? And it just keeps getting worse? Isn't there something I can do? I can take that as the bottom word, the bottom line, the ultimate say in the matter, or as a believer in Jesus Christ, I can do something different. I want the baby at the end of this story. I want my grief to turn to joy. I want my life to not be under whatever the negative situation is telling me. That is not the bottom line. And so in sharing that, I just go, Jesus, I want that hope. Okay, I may not understand. I may not get it. But you're trying to infuse some hope in my soul that there's something better coming. The last verse that I absolutely, like I said, when I started reading this, I was like, oh, dang, I don't want to read it. It's going to be bad because I want, I want Hallmark. I want all happy, fluffy Jesus. And so I almost, like, skipped these passages of Scripture. And when I do that, I know God's going, Tam, I really have something to say to you here. Would you just slow it down? Would you just take the time and listen to me? And I'm so grateful I did because now I have a message to share of what God has spoke to me, to you. The last verse that just absolutely has, has rocked my world. He says, and I put my name here, Tammy, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I am Jesus Christ, and I have overcome the world. 
and I am not leaving you alone as an orphan. I am sending you me. Now I will dwell within you. You will not walk this life alone. No man has a bottom word for you, a bottom line. There's no person in your life that can say, this is the truth, doggone it, and that's, your, that's you. You don't live under the rule of man. You live with the indwelling of God in you because you belong to Jesus Christ when you said yes to him. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Not, I hope I do, just maybe so. I have overcome the world. Gavel down, bottom line. So then how, okay? So knowing that, having that in your mindset, Knowing that that is that solid, capital T is always, Dan always says truth. Bottom line, truth. You are secure in Jesus Christ, and he has overcome the world. All right. I have certain passages of scriptures that are just my passion, my joy, my help, and my strength. So I want to ask you, what is your natural reaction to a suddenly, to maybe it's not sudden, maybe it's just been forever situation? How do you react? Maybe you're lonely. What do you do in your loneliness? Do you chase to fill a void with people? Do you... What do you do? I don't, I don't want to, because I, 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 I don't want to pigeonhole anybody. Ask yourself the question, what is my natural reaction when something happens? We all have a negative reaction to begin with. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. When Dan steps on my toes, I go, oh, praise Jesus, I'm going to run to God and talk to him a minute. No, I go, get off my stinking toe. Don't I? Sometimes a little more flowery than that. <laughs> but we are people, we're humans, we react, okay? That may be just like a little simple glitch in a relationship, but what about the hard stuff? What do we do? Where do we go? My nature is to go, what's wrong with me? Okay, I screwed up. Which I should have done better. Okay, oh my gosh, did I fail somebody? I wasn't perfect. I'm supposed to be perfect all the time. I'm not perfect. I wasn't perfect. <gasps> I wounded somebody. Okay, I go, I go so like 25 fingers. Okay, I have 20, but I added five. And toes. But I go against myself. I start, I start to self-deprecate. I start to self-blame. I start to question everything. And I go, well, what did we do wrong? What's wrong? What did I do wrong? What can I do right? How can I make it better? Can I say I'm sorry? Can I say I'm sorry again? What's your reaction? What do you do in that moment? Do you self-deprecate? Do you blame others? Does the potty mouth come out and you curse others? I do that too. I don't want to admit that, but it's true. We are human beings is what I'm trying to say. There's nobody who's perfect. Nobody has it all together. Nobody does it right. This is going to step on a toe. Not, not one toe, but toes. When relational tragedy happens, we just want to feel validated. We just want to feel loved. We just want to be somebody's everything. And we run after relationships in unhealthy manners and ways that are not good for us because we don't have the ability that God wants us to have to just stay in peace with him because he overcame the world. So what I want to do is look at um, Psalm 23, and this has become truly a chapter in the Bible, a psalm in the scriptures that has changed my life. There's a book called, and Tracy, you just read this book. It's called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23 by Philip Yancey. If you want a good read... Keller, Philip Keller, sorry. Philip, I said Yancey. Who's Philip Yancey? Philip Keller. <laughs> A shepherd's look at Psalm 23. 
He is a shepherd, and he takes a look at this psalm, because David was a shepherd. And so he wanted to, he could totally understand and comprehend the psalm that was being rip, ri, written from a shepherd's point of view. As this is like a, this to me is a prophetic psalm about Jesus as our good shepherd. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul and he guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all my enemies, and my, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness, your love, your kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. So when you read that, that passage, and you think about it as the good shepherd, I have this whole visual idea now from this book, because this good shepherd, he takes the time, he takes the effort, he makes the intentional move to prepare places for us that are going to be for our good. So he is always thinking about attacks from the enemy, the wolves, the lions, the bears, Satan, his demons, people being used by the enemy. He's always looking out on our behalf for us, okay? So in, in the summertime, he creates, he goes up to the mountaintop to a plateau. So do you wonder what a table is? It's the plateau of a mountain. It's a grassy field. It's the meadows. It's the meadows. And he goes and he prepares those meadows for his sheep. And in that preparation, he removes venomous flowers that are purple, and he leaves the white ones, because the white ones you love to eat, the good things. But those purple ones, he knows, those are going to damage you and kill you. So he gets on his hands and knees, and he pulls out each purple flower that he can find. And he prepares that table for you on his hands and knees, looking for how he can protect you. He takes you from the valley in the summertime to this plateau where there's abundant food, there's abundant fruit, there's abundance for you. He takes oil. Do you, have you ever wondered what the oil means? Why you would anoint our heads with oil? Now a sheep deals with flies. Do you notice livestock animals, they always are, you know, batting off the, the flies. Okay, if you anoint the animal's head with oil, all of the places that, are, that a fly can embed themselves in, ears, nostrils, mouth, eyes, those are the demonic whispers of an enemy, bzz, 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 trying to bug you. He anoints us with a covering so that we don't have to listen to the lies of the enemy. He protects us. The anointing Holy Spirit protects us. He anoints us with his presence. What happens when a fly gets into the ear of a sheep? It lays its eggs, and it dies there. What happens to the sheep when the eggs hatch in that moist area? They start buzzing, buzzing, buzzing inside the brain. It's like the demonic host. When they get inside your head, bzz, 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 they drive you crazy. You can't hear. You, get, you go stir crazy. That will kill a sheep because they cannot handle the buzzing in their ears. It, it's, it's just a crazy thing when you look at this psalm and you go, God, you have provided. You are a good shepherd. You provide an anointing over us so that we don't have to battle the lies of the enemy, the buzzings around. We don't have to let those things invade who we are on the inside. Those, those demonic words, those mean-spirited accusations, those things that can wound us on the inside, when we are close to the shepherd, 
and he anoints us, they don't get to come close. So they can be a battle from the outside. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. I want to be by a good shepherd who's got a big old rod and a big old staff when an enemy comes at me, don't you? He's going to beat him over the head. I don't have to. He will. But in all of this, where does the sheep stand to receive this benefit close to the shepherd? If I wander away and I'm cruising the borders, yeah, I see ya, gotcha, but hey, that's kind of cool. What's that over there? Look at that purple flower. Oh, that looks pretty good. You know who's prowling on the outer skirts of that table? The enemy. And he is waiting to pick you off. Is the shepherd's rod going to reach you? If you choose to walk away and wander far from him, he didn't go anywhere. You did. So where are we standing Just like in John 15, remain in me and I will remain in you. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Don't go far from me and think you're not going to have me close. I will always be there, but I cannot rescue what you have chosen to walk away from. So our abiding in Christ is so important as a disciple. Get that book and read it, you guys. It's wonderful. And the promise, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you because I am near. I am near. You are near to me. We'll get through it. You're going to have the benefit of my rod and my staff protecting you. You are going to have the benefit of me anointing you and just caressing you and loving on you every day as you stay close to me. Your eyes are going to see clear. Your ears are going to hear perfectly, and your mouth is going to speak what I share with you. Do you see the blessing of walking close to the Good Shepherd? Jesus tells us that the world will come against you. Hard times will come. Those are promised. They did me too, he says, but I have provided what you will need to stand. I told you all of this so that when the time would come, you would not lose heart or shrink back. That is his promise to us in John 16, because I have overcome the world, and I gave you my Holy Spirit. He will counsel you, teach you, encourage you to remember what I said. He is me living in you, within your hearts, all the time, and you always have access to me at all times. We don't have to be super-duper smart as disciples. We just have to stay close. We just have to stay connected. We just have to be attached. So I say run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. There are two passages of tools that God has given us that to me are crucial as a disciple of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, that says, the weapons of this world are not the weapons we fight with, okay? That's, that's the gist right there. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish strongholds. We demolish every argument, every lie, every negative report, everything that stands against the knowledge of God. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And how do we do that? We take captive every thought and we run it to Jesus. We run it to Jesus. Okay, this was said about me. Now, Scripture says that a wise man will even listen to a fool. 
to question, is there any truth in what's being said about me? We are not fallible people, infallible people. We are fallible people. We make mistakes. We may have a blind spot and we didn't realize. Are there areas in my life a wise disciple will take those things and go, is there any truth? Do I need to evaluate myself? Do I need to look at areas in my life that I may be blind to? But where do I take it to? My self-deprecation? My beating myself up? No, I take it to Jesus. I run to my shepherd. I run to him. I run to Jesus. Jesus, this is what was said to me. Is this true? Jesus, how do I reconcile the, this loss? How do I... I run to Jesus and I ask him. And then he's given us some tools in Ephesians 6. Verses 12 to 18. He gives us the, the armor of God. Now, I've seen many believers use the armor of God apart from the love of Jesus. The armor of God isn't a magic trick. I put on the armor of God every day. I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth. I take up my sword, my shield, and my sword. Okay, great. Do you know those are divine weapons to tear down strongholds? Do you know those are divine, God-given, love-inspired weapons? Three times in Ephesians 6, it says, just stand. I've given you what you need to stand, so just stand. And then he says, just stand. But where am I standing? I do have the helmet of salvation. I can't save myself. Do I use that as a tool to outwit people because I'm so smart in my knowledge of the scriptures? Do I beat people up with my knowledge? Do I think I have all the truth? I can easily, apart from Jesus, I can, excuse me, I can, you know, word whiplash you because of my knowledge. But without love, I'm a clanging symbol. I don't have any depth. I don't have any voice in anybody else's life. I can have breastplate of righteousness. Oh, yeah. I can stand tall. I can puff it out with anybody. But in whose righteousness am I standing? Am I standing in what Jesus did for me? because that is the only righteousness that has value. I got none. I know who I am, and I am a woman who needs Jesus better, I, more than anything in the world. So who do you stand up in? Do you stand up in your head knowledge because you're, you're all that? Are you all that? <laughs> no, Jesus is all that. Jesus is all that. Belt of truth. Man, I can wield it. I can tell you truth, but you know what? I do have some blind spots, and my truth might not be exactly right. So do I have to be right all the time? <laughs> no, that was a toe step, sorry. I'm not always right. And can I be humble to say, you know what, I thought I was right and I'm wrong? Or do I have to stand proud? That's where pride comes in, because we think we know it all. I look at these elections and I look at Christians in this season. I look at us as a body of Christ. Why are we looked at as so judgmental and mean-spirited and hateful and hurtful? Because we're standing in our own flippin' righteousness, in our own belt of truth and in our own helmet of salvation. And then, man, we take up the weapons and then we annihilate. In the name of Jesus, shame on us. Because apart from me, you will not be able to do anything, Jesus says. Apart from my love, remain in my love, remain in connection, abiding in me. I am love given to you by the Father because he so loved us that he sent his son. So when you think about putting on the armor... can't do it in your own strength. That's why I changed the title of the sermon. <laughs> it was Just Stand. Because, man, we've been given some tools to stand. 
When I go stand by the shepherd, though, I don't have to do the battle. My good shepherd is here, and he's whopping, and he's hitting, and he's, he's fighting those bears, and those lions, and those tigers, and those demons, and those hordes that want to take me down. Because our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers and the rulers and the powers of principalities in the air. They're the ones that want to take us down. My brother is not my enemy. My sister is not my enemy. The president-elect nominees are not our enemies. The enemy of our soul is the one who wants to take down mankind. And that's the battle we wage in the heavenlies with the spiritual weapons. So if you have stuff going on in your life, run to Jesus. Let's find out what he says about the situation. Let's see if he needs to prune us a little bit so that we can grow and bear more fruit. Or is he allowing us to experience maybe some of the effects of our own decisions in our own lives apart from him? And he's saying, I want to woo you back to me. Come back to me. Remain in me. You've wandered the borders. You've been a wanderer. Come close and let me teach you how to just stand. Give you wisdom as you're standing. But you are right with me, connected. And man, I want to be so close. I want to touch his leg as I'm standing there. <laughs> I want to be, I, I, want, I want so much to know the heart of Jesus in every situation. So I'm, I'm so probably way late. Oh, yeah, I am. But what I want to do, I, we were all, were all promised hard times. It's part of life on the earth because this is a fallen place. I want you today to take your communion, and we don't normally do this, but I want you to take your situation Remain in me and I will remain in you and just stand. I want you to take your communion and I want you, this is like a prophetic act. I want you to run to Jesus. Let's just say Jesus is standing right here at the altar. I want you to run to the altar with whatever you're dealing with. Wherever you are in your life, you may need to know Jesus. You may have walked away from him. You may be wandering the outskirts in our feeling, the, the lack and the loss of your life. I want you to come forward, and I want you, to the best of your ability, get on your knees and say, Jesus, I run back to you. I come to you, Jesus, with this situation, with this loss, with this pain, with this ailment. I come to you, Jesus, because you said, do this in remembrance of me, and Jesus, I choose to remember you. So I want you all to stand up. And after I pray, I want you to come forward. And let's just, let's just hover around the altar. But I, it, it's not for anybody else. This is between you and Jesus. So Jesus, we thank you that you have, you did it all. You had in mind what you were going to do and you did it. You accomplished it. Now, Father, I pray that you would speak to your people. I ask you to enlighten and, and breathe hope into your people right now with whatever they're walking through, whatever situation they're hurting in, that they know that they can come to you and that you stand as their advocate on their behalf and your Holy Spirit indwelling them will give them everything they need to stand. So, Lord, we take this communion in honor of you, in remembrance of what you did, and we say thank you. So when you're